You ready? Let's go through these questions, ladies and gentlemen. So these questions are focusing us on the big ideas that we should have an understanding of when it comes to the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. So question number one says, outline the territory that was lost by Germany as a result of the Versailles Treaty. Why was this problematic according to Hitler? All right, first things first. Territory that was lost by Germany. Well, there was the loss of sovereignty in the area known as the Rhineland, which is that parcel of land on the uh, western side of Germany that borders, of course, Belgium and France. Uh, so there's that. Uh, there is the fact that uh, Union or Anschluss with Austria is forbidden. Uh, and then specifically territory of actual physical land that was lost. We had uh, an area of Germany known as the Sudetenland, which was lost to the new nation of Czechoslovakia, which was created out of the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then most importantly was the area that gave Poland access up to the sea known as the Polish or Danzig Corridor. It's called the Danzig Corridor because the city of Danzig, Poland, is located smack dab in the middle of it. And if you go back and look at that map of Germany uh, that demonstrates sort of the territory which was taken away from them by the Versailles Treaty, you will see that Greater Germany was separated from uh, East Prussia. And this was a problem. Now, why was it a problem according to Hitler? Hitler believed in this idea of Aryan superiority. He wanted to unite all of the Germanic people. Hitler believed that the Germanic people were the most evolved, the smartest, the strongest, and through this sort of socially Darwinistic way of thinking, he believed that it should be the Germanic people who rule the world. This was the entire purpose of the Third Reich, to create this thousand-year empire that dominated Europe. All right, so that's number one. Moving on, number two. What economic problems did Germany face prior to the support for the Nazis increasing dramatically? Uh, two things. Number one, we had unemployment. Beginning in 1929, unemployment in Germany spiked. And guess what? Support for the Nazis at that time also started to go up. And of course, that was related to the fact that Dawes plan money, that loan, that America was giving to Germany to pay back reparations ended. The Dawes plan was in effect from 1924 to 1929. And once that plan, the Dawes plan ends, uh, Germany is no longer getting money and the economic situation in Germany becomes very, very dire. Now, the second big issue that we have in Germany beyond the unemployment is also the phenomenon of hyperinflation. Again, inflations were a dollar today buys you less than a dollar did yesterday. And as long as wages keep up with inflation, you're no further behind. However, in Germany, the increase in the cost of goods rapidly outstripped the amount of money that Germans were getting paid. So what did this mean? It meant that, you know, one day a loaf of bread might cost uh, 50 marks. The next day it might be 50,000 right? A month down the road, it might be 50 million. Like it got absolutely ridiculous. People were paying for things like loaves of bread with wheelbarrows full of money. And it created a lot of economic insecurity, which ultimately played into the hands of Hitler and the Nazis because they claimed to be the ones who would be able to fix this. And as I mentioned before, uh, by 1938, the economic issues in Germany were basically over, right? Hitler took a broken, battered, defeated Germany and made them into an economic and a military superpower. Hence why in 1938, Hitler was awarded the distinction of Times Magazine Man of the Year. And just wrap your brain around that for a second. Like there was no person on earth more deserving than for this distinction than Adolf Hitler was, according to Time Magazine. Man, things get weird. Okay, number three says, uh, according, or sorry, explain Hitler's concept of Lebensraum, 
Why was this important according to Hitler? All right, Lebensraum, German word meaning living space. Now, why did Germany want to secure living space? Well, when you go out and you take land, what do you gain from it? You gain from it resources, right? The things under the earth. You also gain human resources. So natural resources and human resources are gained when you expand your empire. So did Hitler expand the German Empire? Absolutely. He expanded it a little bit to the west of Germany into France, but mainly he expanded into the east of Europe, right? He went into Central Europe, uh, took uh, nations like Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland, etc. And then he even moved into the Soviet Union. Why the Soviet Union? Because it is a massive state, lots of natural resources, right? Uh, and to gain those resources meant to secure the future for your empire. And when we talked about fascism before, I mentioned how uh, the the whole MO of a fascist state is to make the nation or state stronger, right? Everything that's done in a fascist state is to make the state stronger. Um, now, number four, explain the concept of Gross Deutschland and how it factored into the territorial ambition of Hitler. Gross Deutschland is a term that means greater Germany. What Hitler wanted to do was unite the Germanic people together. These Germanic people, um, they descend from a group in Northern Europe called the Teutons, right? There's a whole fable made up about it. But basically, these are the, this, the original uh, Aryans, right? These are the blonde hair, blue eyed super people that Hitler believed in. And it's kind of ironic that Hitler was neither blonde haired or blue eyed. As a matter of fact, I was reading an article yesterday that suggested that Hitler had both Jewish roots and also, believe it or not, African roots as well. There's been DNA tests done on him. And yeah, it kind of shatters that idea of Aryan superiority. So anyways, Gross Deutschland unite the Germanic people together. Germanic people live in Austria. Uh, Germanic people lived in what was now Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland. Uh, Germanic people lived in Poland in that Polish corridor. He wanted to bring them all together into the fold of the Reich, the empire, and dominate Europe as the Aryans rightfully should, as he believed. Again, this whole idea of social Darwinism factoring in here, the belief that it's all about survival of the fittest. You either conquer or you are conquered. And Hitler believed that it is the destiny of Germanic people to conquer and dominate and live fruitful lives, right? And to get all the spoils of war and victory and conquest to make the nation of Germany that much better. All right, number five, uh, why was Hitler asked to be the leader of the German Workers' Party? Because he was good, because he was a very effective public speaker. He had charisma that people just paid attention to. Um, so in 1921, Anton Drexler basically steps aside and gives Hitler the torch and that uh, at that time was called the German Workers Party and then Hitler quickly changes it to the Nazis. Okay, moving on. Number six. Let me just move down a little bit here. Uh, number six says, explain the significance of the Beer Hall Putsch and how it ultimately benefited Hitler. The Beer Hall Putsch, right, November uh, of 1924, uh, it was the first major political maneuver of Hitler and the Nazis, right? It demonstrated the ambition that the Nazis had to try to gain power in Germany. Um, did it work? Absolutely not, right? They tried to seize a Bavarian government. Uh, it didn't work. The putsch kind of landed flat on its face. Uh, the Nazis, many of them are arrested, uh, including Hitler. They get put on trial and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, on trial for treason, he gets off pretty light because the judge is a fan of Hitler and his politics. Um, and guys, ultimately, I would argue it benefited Hitler by, um, it taught him that power needed to be seized in legal ways. Uh, and we see that with the Enabling Act later. And then uh, it also allowed him while in jail for nine months to write that book, Mein Kampf, which made him an even more popular 
politician in Germany. As I mentioned before, Mein Kampf was a bestseller in Germany. Germans loved that book. Now, number seven, why do we see support for the Nazis dramatically increase in the 1930s? The answer here, economic insecurity, right? The Great Depression um, basically kicks Germany in the butt, right? It just boots them. And as times get worse, support for the Nazis dramatically increases. Okay, moving on. Number eight. Why does President Hindenburg appoint Hitler Chancellor in 1933? So January 30th, 1933, uh, we see support for the Nazis uh, eventually hit, uh, you know, a, a fairly high number. The Nazis are by far and away the biggest party in the German Reichstag. So why does President Hindenburg, the one guy who's above Hitler, right? If this is Hindenburg right here, this is Hitler right there. Why does he appoint Hitler Chancellor? Now, remember... Until the Enabling Act is passed on the 23rd of March, 1933, we are still living technically in the Weimar Republic Socialist Liberal Democracy. It is not a dictatorship yet. Now, the job of government is to pass laws, to create legislation which ultimately makes the lives of the people better. And as the biggest party in the Reichstag, Hindenburg knew that he needed the Nazis to be on his side in order to pass effective legislation and do the job of governing. So that's what happens on the 30th of January, 1933. Number nine, how does the fire in the Reichstag benefit the Nazis? Um, again, Hitler claims that a communist set the fire. Um, he sells this narrative of fear to the people of Germany, right? Like a monument uh, in Germany is destroyed. This represents our democracy. This is an attack on Germany. Uh, and ultimately, guys, what happens is um, he uh, more or less pushes the German parliament to pass that thing called the Enabling Act, right? Uh, he sells himself as the only person who will be able to bring back order and uh, kind of pull Germany from the uh, chaos that they're um, experiencing at this point, right? Like this was a national tragedy and Hitler presented himself as the guy who can kind of make the seas nice and calm once again, right? We're in rough waters here. Now Hitler's coming along very calm, very methodical, claiming that, you know what, we can fix this. We can root out these traitors. And the people of Germany liked what he was saying. Okay, number 10. Uh, why is the death of President Hindenburg significant in the rise of Hitler? Again, Hindenburg, Hitler, right? Number one. Number two. Um, with Hindenburg passing away in 1934 uh, from natural causes, right? He wasn't assassinated. He wasn't poisoned, anything like that. He was an old man, right? He was in his mid-80s. Uh, once Hindenburg died, the only check on Hitler's power was gone. And with that check on power gone, what Hitler does, and I'm just going to scroll down here, uh, he passes this thing called the Enabling Act less than a month later, right? Um, the Enabling Act gives Hitler total power in Germany. And that, of course, happens on the 23rd of March, 1933. The German parliament literally voted away their rights and freedoms. They voted away constitutional supremacy and constitutional limits, and it gave Hitler the ability to basically do whatever he wants in Germany. And how did that turn out? Not very good. Number 11, what was the Night of the Long Knives? Um, uh, and how was it important in securing Hitler's dictatorship? Uh, the Night of the Long Knives was the purge of the Nazi party. If you are a dictator, you want to get rid of people who pose a threat to your power. Now, who was purged uh, over the course of these uh, three nights or so? Uh, it was the members of the brown shirts. Ironically enough, it was the brown shirts who kind of helped Hitler rise to power. They were his original sort of like thugged booted individuals. Um, but as their numbers grew, uh, Ernst Röhm, who was the leader of the brown shirts, also known as the SA or the stormtroopers, 
Um, and yes, George Lucas uses the name Stormtroopers for Darth Vader's sort of, you know, uh, white dressed henchmen. Um, so anyways, these Stormtroopers, uh, their loyalty to Hitler is eventually questioned in 1934, right? They number about uh, 2 million in total. The leader, Ernst Röhm, uh, is becoming very, very powerful. So what Hitler decides to do is engage in a purge to kill off anyone who is a threat or a potential threat to his power. Why do you do that as a dictator? Well, when you get rid of your enemies, it only further cements your position of power in that nation. So this is just dictatorship 101 here. So it's called the Night of the Long Knives. Know it as a series of political assassinations to entrench the power of Hitler. And again, as I mentioned before, we see this in uh, every dictatorship. Kim Jong-un in North Korea, I mean, that guy's purged his uncle. Uh, and, you know, in um, Stalin Soviet Union, uh, 34, 1934 to 1938, same thing going on, right? Show trials, fake arrests, um, forced confessions, and then people shot or sent to the gulags. So it is, it's just simply use of force and terror. That's what it is, right? It destabilizes the nation, uh, and it ultimately leads to, uh, the elimination of dissent, which is what dictators want. Now, lastly, number 12. Explain the events of Kristallnacht. What happened? What did the events foreshadow? Kristallnacht translates to the night of broken glass. This is considered to be the beginning of the Holocaust. On this evening, um, Nazi, or Nazi uh, Jewish homes were targeted by Nazis. Jewish synagogues were targeted by Nazis. And Jewish businesses were targeted by Nazis. Nazis. They were uh, ransacked, their windows were smashed in, hence the term uh, Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass, uh, and synagogues were set ablaze. Jews around Germany were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Uh, and then last part of number 12, what did the events foreshadow? It foreshadowed the Holocaust, right? Or as Hitler called it, the final solution, right? The final solution to eliminate the Jew from Germany. Man, that is a depressing set of questions. Here's the good news. Um, coming up after this, we're going to start looking at the Cold War, which to me, right, it's not as depressing, even though we came much, much closer to uh, destroying the earth as we know it through nuclear war. All right. Anyways, peace out, guys. We'll check you later. Click like, click subscribe, smash that notification button. Peace.